the rain is irritating, the garbage is irritating, and these stupid blackberries sure are irritating. You know, that makes me wonder, which plant is the most irritating? Maybe you've had an encounter with a plant that gave you a rash. Maybe it injected you full of its chemicals. Or maybe you only eat meat because you swear that plants are irritating your stomach. Well, I've only been eating meat for, for almost five years now. Many plants make irritating chemicals for self-defense purposes. In this video, we will be discussing some of the most irate plant irritants. Hmm. I sure I'm curious about that stream. Curious? Stream? This video is sponsored by Curiosity Stream. If you'd like to watch more educational videos just like this one, you should check out Curiosity Stream. They have a library of thousands of documentaries and nonfiction topics spanning science, nature, history, technology, military history, music, food, and more. Curiosity Stream has something for everyone. They have documentaries like Breakthrough What is CRISPR? Did you know that CRISPR Cas9 has been used to treat a child with cancer? I didn't. Another documentary they have is The Body, The Networks Within Our Body, which discusses the different ways that communication flows between all the organs in our bodies. Curiosity Stream has something for everyone. Best of all, you can stream to any device. You can watch on your TV, computer, or even your mobile device. Curiosity Stream is very affordable at under $4 a month to get access to thousands of hours of high quality documentaries and series. They're adding new content every week, so there's always something new to watch. Subscribe to Curiosity Stream using the link in the video description to start exploring the world around you. I want to thank Curiosity Stream for their support of this channel. The first molecule is abiotic acid. Abiotic acid is primarily found in pine trees or conifers. This has a carboxylic acid group, and it's also a diene. Aside from this, it roughly looks like it's related to a steroid. Steroids have three cyclohexane rings as well as a cyclopentane ring, although abiotic acid only has three cyclohexane rings, hence why it's only slightly related. Abiotic acid serves as a minor irritant and repellent against insects and parasites for these trees, and these irritant properties apply to humans as well. As an irritant, it has fairly minor effects on human skin. You don't want to rub pine needles all over yourself or anything, but it won't be too painful, and it's technically safe for human consumption. Though, don't go actively eating this stuff. Abiotic acid does have some uses outside of being a simple irritant as well. It's the primary component in rosin, for example. For the non-musicians out there, rosin is frequently used on the bows of violins or other string instruments to help add friction and get a better sound out of the instrument. Since you can eat pine trees and it can be used for the bows of violins and related string instruments, I don't think that this one's too irritating, so why don't we put it into like F tier. F for totally fine for me. But the next molecule isn't so fine. The next molecule is an example of a urushiol. Urushiol is a compound best known as the irritant in poison oak, poison sumac, as well as poison ivy. Urushiols have a catechol motif, and this side chain, which is this long alkyl group, can have various alkenes and various lengths, depending on the plant that it comes from. For example, western poison oak urushiol contains mostly C17 side chains, while poison ivy and poison sumac mostly contain catechols with C15 side chains, meaning that it's 15 carbons long. Now, if you've ever taken a hike in shorts or do a lot of yard work, you've likely run into these urushiol containing plants. Contact with them leads to a condition known as urushiol induced contact dermatitis, essentially a major allergic reaction. Symptoms such as itchiness, rashes, swelling, and even blistering are associated with UICD and can take weeks to subside. It's worth noting that not everyone is sensitive to urushiol, and around 15-30% to 30 of people show no allergic response. At the same time, however, around a quarter of all people experience an acute reaction to urushiol. You might like cashews, but certain parts of the cashew fruit contain large amounts of urushiol, and the people who prepare the nuts have to take special precautions, otherwise they get severe chemical burns. There's a lot of videos of this on YouTube, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to use them, so you're going to have to go look them up on like Food Insider or one of those other YouTube channels. Urushiol, you have a specific medical condition named after you, so I think that means you have to go right into A tier. And it's also really irritating to say its name. This is anacardic acid. This is an orthohydroxybenzoic acid, also known as a salicylic acid, although it also has this long alkyl chain with some alkenes that kind of remind me of a molecule called anandamide. Anacardic acids are a class of compounds found in the fruiting bodies and shells of cashew nuts. Anacardic acids are extremely similar to the structure of urushiol, simply having a carboxylic acid, rather than a hydroxyl group. 
If we compare this to Urushiol, you can see how similar they look. This is more or less the same thing. Similarly, anacardic acids can trigger Urushiol-induced contact dermatitis, though it's much less likely you'll be covered in cashew shells than just randomly brush up against a poison oak. Anacardic acids also have uses as a repellent for insects and small pests, and research is currently underway testing antibacterial effects. So you're not as likely to encounter this as Urushiol, but it's almost as bad as Urushiol is, and it can cause the same medical condition. So for that reason, I think we're going to have to put it into B tier. But it does start with an A, so why don't we put it into A tier? Next we have <laughs> Aconitine is primarily found in Aconitum, a genus of flowering plants found in mountainous regions. There's a lot to say about this structure, as there's several different hydroxy groups, as well as four ethers, a couple different esters, as well as this nitrogen. If you see a nitrogen, you should automatically go, this is probably bioactive. Nitrogen equals alkaloid, because when these are in plants, they're usually protonated. And to deprotonate them, you have to treat them with alkaline, also known as basic conditions. Hence why alkaloids are made alkaline. They're extracted after being treated with alkaline. Now, the entire aconitum plant produces and contains this particular compound. And while as an irritant, it can lead to numbness in the fingers, it's also an acute toxin. Aconitine binds to the sodium ion channel in cells, which typically open then close in very short intervals to maintain a membrane potential in the cell. This is incredibly important in terms of maintaining proper function of our nervous system. Aconitine, however, binds to these sodium channels, locks them open, and prevents our nervous system from properly functioning. The consumption of aconitine typically leads to symptoms like dizziness, nausea, weakness in the muscles, and even deadly paralysis of the heart or respiratory system. That sounds pretty irritating to me, so I think aconitine's probably going to have to go right into S tier. This is conine. Conine is the main toxin found in hemlock. This has a piperidine ring, as well as this propyl group, and to an organic chemist, this doesn't look like it would be toxic at all. This just looks like an obscure base somebody would use for a chemical reaction. Hemlock is one of the most prolific poisons throughout history and antiquity, being used in ancient Greece and the Roman Empire, throughout medieval Europe, and even in modern times. Conine is found throughout the plant, and, if ingested, will bind to and block the nicotinic receptors across the body. This essentially blocks your nervous system from telling your muscles to move, resulting in full body paralysis, followed by death once your respiratory system is completely paralyzed. Conine poisoning isn't just a concern for humans, but livestock as well. Farmers and ranchers have to be on the lookout for hemlock growing on their fields, as cows have a tendency to eat them and then croak. So conine, you're killing cows out there, which sounds utterly terrible, so we're going to have to put you right into S tier. The next one looks a little bit like an amino acid called histidine, and that's because it's derived from that. This is histamine. Histamine is an allergen, and it's the primary irritant in plants like stinging nettles. This has an imidazole ring, as well as an amino group. Stinging nettles contain a number of compounds outside of histamine that give them their stinging effects, like formic acid, as well as tartaric acids, but histamine is the main source of this irritation. Acute exposure to histamine leads to inflammation, itchiness, and pain in the affected area, but this can be remedied with antihistamines. I actually decided to test this after I stung myself with some stinging nettles. There were some plants kind of close to my house, and I did it just for you. I stung myself, got home, you could see that it inflamed quite a bit, and then I applied this topical antihistamine to it, and the inflammation went away. At least mostly. By the next day, you couldn't even tell anything had happened, other than a couple tiny marks on my arm. These antihistamines work by blocking the actual histamine receptors in your skin, preventing the associated harmful effects of histamine exposure. A number of plant-based foods like legumes and fermented products are also high in histamines, and their overconsumption can lead to hives, headaches, and stomach problems. Our histamine receptors are normally present to help fight infections when an infection occurs, so that our body can signal to white blood cells that, hey, stuff needs to happen, we need to get stuff going on here. But when a plant suddenly injects you full of it, that's pretty irritating. So overall, this isn't too bad. I would say it's probably like a D tier one. Unless you're getting injected with tons of it, you're probably going to be all right, and it can be easily treated with an antihistamine. This funky boy here is Forball. Forball is a tetracyclic system, as there's a seven-membered, a six-membered, a three-membered, and a five-membered ring. It has an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone, and it's also a penta-alcohol, as there's five alcohol groups. This one's an allylic alcohol. Forball is primarily found in the seeds of Croton tiglium, also known as purging cotton. Forball as a compound has a number of effects on the human body, some of which can be considered medicinal. 
It's been used as a purgative or laxative since antiquity, hence the name purging cotton. Outside of that, forball is a minor skin allergen and irritant, and, if consumed, promotes the growth of tumors. While not explicitly a carcinogen, it's been shown to amplify the effects of other carcinogens in lab rats. To that end, forball has uses in laboratory settings and modeling carcinogenesis, the generation of tumor growth, and cancer in model species. Forball helps give you cancer. That's not very helpful, so I think we're going to have to put forball right into A tier. A, because it kind of looks like an A, if we look at that one ring there. That, that's definitely an A, right? Here, I'll show you. We'll make it a little bit easier. There we go. Hopefully that terrible joke wasn't too taxing, but the next molecule might tax you a little bit more. This is a taxine, and the taxines are a class of alkaloids primarily found in the yew tree. Taxine is found throughout the entirety of the yew tree, and these trees are found all around the world. Much like hemlock and conine, the yew and taxines have been known since ancient times as a powerful poison. Once in the body, taxine affects the cardiovascular system, and more specifically, the calcium and sodium ion channels in heart cells. This prevents proper function of heart cells, leading to a dramatically reduced heart rate, arrhythmia, and eventually cardiovascular failure. Having your heart fail is pretty irritating, so we're going to have to put taxine right into S tier. You don't like paying taxes, and you don't like having your heart fail either. This is bergaptin. Bergaptin is a unique sort of irritant found in numerous species of carrots and citrus fruits. This doesn't just mean like the carrots we eat, but the carrot family of plants includes a wide variety of different plants. This has a coumarin ring, but it also has a furan ring. If we just had the left part, this would be called a benzofuran, and if we just had the right part, this would be called a coumarin. So this, altogether, is known as a furanocoumarin, since it has both of them. There's also a methyl ether. Bergaptin is what's known as a photosensitizer, which means it aids in the absorption of light. If you get sufficient quantities of bergaptin on your skin, then expose it to UV light from the sun, the result is a condition known as phytophotodermatitis. Typical symptoms include redness, inflammation, and boils. It's essentially a sunburn, but worse. Bergaptin presents health concerns inside the body as well. In sufficient quantities in vitro, it can lead to chromosomal anomalies during cell division, and there's good reason to believe bergaptin is a carcinogen as well. Bergaptin, you're giving people cancer, and you have your own disease named after yourself. That's pretty irritating. Bergaptin, you can go right into A tier. Plus, you rhyme with mercaptin, and mercaptin stinks, so this definitely belongs in S tier. Convalitoxin. Convalitoxin is the poisonous compound found in the lily of the valley. This has a steroid structure, as well as five alcohol groups, an ether, an aldehyde, and what's known as a 2-furanone. Even though it has toxin in the name, the dose makes the poison, and convalitoxin actually has a number of interesting therapeutic applications. For example, in nanomolar doses, convalitoxin is used to treat heart arrhythmias and heart failure in patients. Convalitoxin has also shown use in lung, breast, and colon cancer treatments, though the exact mechanism is still a topic of research. Again, these convalitoxin treatments are all done with nanomolar concentrations. Anything higher than that, and you'll get into poison territory. Convalitoxin poisoning includes symptoms like fatigue and nausea on the low end, to cardiac arrest, heart failure, and even death on the extreme. That's pretty irritating, and even though it has some therapeutic uses, dying is pretty irritating. But killing cancer is pretty based, so why don't we put it halfway between S tier and A tier? Next we have tulipalin A. Tulipalin A, as per its name, is a compound found in tulips. This is kind of like the furanone from before, we just have this exocyclic double bond sticking off of the ring. This makes this a gamma-butyrolactone. This is actually technically a derivative of GBL, which is used as a solvent and also a recreational drug. Tulips are, of course, an extremely popular and beautiful ornamental flower, but they still need to be handled carefully. The tulipalin A found in their flowers leads to inflammation and irritation on skin exposure, a condition often called tulip finger. Tulip bulbs have also been eaten during times of famine and hunger, but should be generally avoided in the modern era. There is a significant amount of tulipalin A in tulip bulbs, and if consumed, leads to symptoms such as vomiting, sweats, and even heart palpitations. This one doesn't sound like it's going to kill you, but it does still sound pretty irritating, and even though it ends with an A, I think we're going to have to put it into, like, C tier. It's pretty irritating, it can give you heart arrhythmias, that still sounds pretty scary. Last but not least, we have capsaicin. Capsaicin is the compound found in peppers that gives them their characteristic heat. It's a derivative of vanillin, and you could consider this a vanillyl amide, which is what this portion of the molecule is called. It's bound through this carboxylic acid derivative, which together forms an amide. Capsaicin works by triggering the TRPV1 protein, 
which is a structure that sends signals to the nervous system saying that things are hot or you're in pain. While TRPV1 is triggered primarily by high temperatures, such as those over 43 degrees Celsius or so, it's also triggered by acidic conditions and, of course, capsaicin. Capsaicin will produce an irritating sensation on the skin, but this effect is much more pronounced on the tongue, of course, as well as some other mucous membranes. Make sure you wash your hands after cutting hot peppers, otherwise you will regret it. Capsaicin is irritating not just to humans either. The TRPV1 protein is found in nearly all animals, and this in turn deters insects and other parasites from eating pepper plants. Interestingly, however, birds have a modified form of TRPV1, which renders them immune to capsaicin's burning effects, as it allows the birds to consume these hot peppers and then deposit their seeds elsewhere. Capsaicin, you're one hot molecule, but if you've tried any really spicy hot sauces, you'll definitely be a bit irritated. It can even be used in some riot control agents as pepper spray, so it's pretty irritating. I think capsaicin belongs in B tier. In this video, we discussed a number of different plant irritants, as well as the effects once you're exposed to them. If you have any good plant irritant stories, make sure you drop them down below, and maybe they'll end up in a future plant irritant themed compilation. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.